What up, world? It's been a minute, huh? First off, this series is going to be a little bit different. I ain't never gave y'all no video of me actually breaking stuff down, giving you pure scholarship. On this one, we actually going to do that. We're not going to throw no slick shots. We're just going to throw the shots directly at us. What are we talking about? But I'm going to try not to do that and just focus on the reality of the situation and just give you the truth and the facts as they, as they come, as they are. So uh, I actually recorded this video back in February, but this is just me doing the voiceovers now. So you ain't got to actually get none of these books that, are, that I'm showing you. I'm just showing you that I'm not a, a Google scholar, or a Wikipedia scholar, or a YouTube scholar. That I actually do this. I actually own these books. I actually read these books. I don't diagonally read or sight read. I don't just get on Google books, type in words. And just quote whatever I see and pretend that I own the book. I don't do that. But moving right along. What's this? Slavery in the History of Muslim Black Africa. That's actually a pretty good book. This next one coming up, Africa Remember. I know how everybody be talking about uh, Elado Ikuwano. He actually wasn't the only one who wrote a story. There are actually several Africans who have similar stories such as his. We most definitely going to get into the Berbers. That's gonna be a, a good part of the of the of the series. And I gotta give a shout out to uh Team Osiris, my guy Herbert from Team Osiris. I haven't even actually read this book all the way, man. But there's one quote in here that I just gotta use. I don't not not supposed to do that, but it's one quote I just got to use because it, it fits so nicely with this presentation, with this series. Of course, I got my guy Nehemia on deck. We got some crazy people who call him a polemic or whatever. We got my guy Maino Dayak, a Tureg. His book called The Tureg Tragedy. We're going to let the Turegs speak for themselves. We're moving right along. We got the Archaeology of Islam in Sub-Saharan Africa by Timothy Unsall. Some people pretend to have read the book and they even have the audacity to quote the book knowing they haven't read the book fully or even understand it. 
But anyway, moving along, this book of aspects of West African history actually have uh, the quotations from the beginning of this video are from uh, this book. This is by Muhammad Bello, the son of Usman Dunfodio. But moving right along, we're not going to quote too much out of um, Islam and the African American experience. We're not going to touch too much on it. We're just going to give you some a few names out of it. Now, this book, The Negro Land of the Arabs, it's, it's kind of outdated. Well, it is outdated. It's just one good quote at the beginning of it that I like, but it's outdated. Of course, we're going to do slavery and slave trade in Nigeria. Uh, my Hebrew brothers might like this book, Jews of a Saharian Oasis. My guy, Kareem Magali, uh, he's responsible for a lot of stuff. He's actually a Berber. But moving right along, Nigerian Perspectives. This one has some good translations from Al Fistali and Al Sauti from Cairo, Egypt. Some good, some good quotations. Now we going there. I want you to know we are going there. The Arabs have harmed all of our land. Got to be careful with that word Arab, though. And this just man. This just the beginning. You know we're gonna do the whole Moroccan thing, the Moroccan invasion, all that stuff. Trimming ham. His work kind of outdated to me, but a lot of people still use it. We got a little a few quotes out of it too. You know we got Bernard Lewis. Of course, Nehemia yet again. Well, he was just the editor in this one. So check out all the authors. But man, I'm trying to speed this part up, man. Cut out all the shenanigans, because you Americans funny. And when I say you Americans funny, I'm talking about you poverty pimps, you know. Black people ruled everything in the world type people, you know. Black people ruled Europe type people, you know, you people who seen a, a Colors That's Hidden DVD and, and think it's the truth and think that was reality. Okay, but moving right along, we got the medieval West Africa. That's, uh, that's the little brother to the big brother of the corpus. The corpus is the big brother to that. And you know, man, of course we got the almanac of African peoples. What else we got after that, man? Oh, the main course. Uh, our rock man, Al Sadie. The Tariq of Sudan. And uh, Mahmoud Kadis, the Tariq Fatouche. That's the main course where we mostly going to be quoting from. Want to go to the 19th, 18th centuries. Of course, we got the Sudanese memoirs with the uh, Canoe Chronicles in it. And the course is, is highly influenced by Kareem Magali. And uh, let me just say this, we're not going to be dealing with uh, suspect works, pseudo works, highly questionable works, you know, highly biased books such as this right here, you know, suspect, pseudo, and this book, this highly questionable book, we're not going to use them, we're not even going to take no shots, they just put them on the shelf, man, leave them books alone. And uh, I know I recommended this book, The Legacy of, of Arab Islam, but we're not going to use that either because it's highly biased. We're not going to do that. But like I say, man, it is what it is. If you feel offended, I mean, fuck your feelings. I welcome you, I welcome you to the land of the blacks, man. Let's get it. Uh, what's this, about 30, 30 to 40 books? And this is not even all of them. This is not even counting the journals and stuff, man. But we're going to get it in on this one. There's going to be some real scholarship. None of that blacks did everything. And also none of that blacks was docile type stuff, man. This is the reality. I'm going to show you the real deal. And of course, you know, I got this. So you know it's going down. But yeah, man. Let's rock out. Why West Africa? Why not? Everybody seemed to be focused on the Northeast Africa with Egypt and North Africa and the Orient. Why not?
Now, if you're the type that believe in hyperdiffusionism, this video is not for you. Hyperdiffusionism is when you believe that one civilization created everything, whether it be Sumer or Egypt or whatever, Mesopotamia or whatever. If you believe one civilization created everything and then civilization spread to everywhere else, this is not the video for you. This extreme fringe work. And this is not something that I deal with. If you believe just because there are pyramids in America and there's pyramids in Egypt, that somehow, some way these people are connected, this video is just not for you, man. That's just, it's false, man. It's a false narrative. Other than that, man, you're going to enjoy this video. Start with the civilized mission. The tendency to see history in the Sudan is proceeding from north to south, as it were, from North Africa via the Sahara to the Sudan. This distinction has not been observed by writers on the Sudanic empires, with the result that even the origins of state formation are associated with the influence of trans-Saharan commerce and, indeed, with a civilizing mission said to have been exerted on the Sudan by the Southern Saharan. In reality, it really rested on local commerce, mainly between the Middle Niger Delta on the one hand and between the pastoralists of the Sahara, meaning nobody came from the outside and brought these people civilization, meaning Islam wasn't as big of an impact as people try to make it out to be. Civilizations already existed over here. Again, we ask, why West Africa is not glorious enough? is not old enough. Hollywood isn't making any movies. None of that is true. And I'm going to show you what really, or what first got me interested in West Africa in the first place. This is what got me interested, and maybe it will get you interested. This is from al Bakri from the 11th century. This is from his book, Highways and Kingdoms. The title is at the top, well, the titling of this subchapter or this section. But among the strange things found, there is a pool where water collects, and in it a plant grows of which the roots are the surest means of strengthening and aiding sexual powers. Basically, the little blue pill. The king reserves this for himself and does not allow anyone else to partake in it. He owns an enormous number of women, and when he wants to make the round of them, he warns them one day before takes the medicine and then takes them all in turn and scarcely flags or goes limp. See, that one was kind of funny, but this one, this one is what let me know that I was really on to something. Janae is a large, well-favored and blessed city, characterized by prosperity, good fortune and compassion. God bestowed these things upon that land as innate characteristics. It is the nature of Janae's inhabitants to be kind and charitable and solicitous for one another. However, when it comes to matters of daily life, competitiveness is very much a part of their character, to such an extent that if anyone attains a higher status, the rest uniformly hate him, though without making this apparent or letting it show. Only if there occurs some change of fortune from which God protect us will each of them display his hatred in word and deed. See, that let me know right there. That's every black community around the world. That let me know that I was on to something. Now, hopefully I got your attention and you're a little bit more interested in learning about the history of the blacks. This is the introduction to the land of the blacks. Emphasis on the Sudanic empires. What we will cover, the race, the ethnicities of the people, Islam, introduction of the two major chronicles, Tariq Sudan and Tariq Fatouche, a study of two notables, Mansa Musa, Askia Muhammad. Of course, we're going to talk about other people and the fall of classical African civilization. I want to let you know that we're going to say some things or I'm going to say some things that are just uncomfortable to certain people. It's just not going to sit right with certain people. But I, but I can only give you the realities, man. It, it is what it is. Here's a map of West Africa. It's over 2 million square miles. Our focus is on the Sahel and the Sudanic savannah. It's the dotted area with areas immediately below it. 
the history of the Sahel is complicated, very complicated. I just want you to focus on the data areas. Now, Mauritania is kind of complicated as well, but the, the history we're talking about is just the southern edges of Mauritania. Here's a little known fact, or modern day fact, Mauritania isn't actually included in West Africa. Go do your own research. Now stuff about to get interesting. A lot of y'all working with assumptions. I want you to know that this area is filled with a variety of people. I shouldn't have to say this, but I'm, have to, I'm going to say it anyway. Everybody in Africa is not black. I just want you to know that now. It may sound normal for, for regular people, but it's a lot of nutty people who actually believe everybody in Africa is black. Now, we have to make a point on race. The viewer must understand that race is a social construct. Understanding that race is a social construct, the viewer must also understand that throughout history, societies constructed race differently at different time periods. Now, what you see today in the Western world, that's not the end all be all to what race is. Around the world, at different time periods to different people, race took on different meanings. That's just a fact. Now we go to the writings of Bruce Hall, A History of Race in Muslim West Africa. Along the Sahel in West Africa, a long history of racial language is evident in the writings of Muslim intellectuals well before the arrival of Europeans. Sahelian writers made a fundamental distinction between whites what they call by then, for those who claimed Arab predigrees and blacks or the Sudan. In these texts, blackness worked as a marker of inferiority that created significant legal disability for people who could be labeled this way. Now, like I said, stuff about to get interesting, especially to, to certain black Euro-Americans or black people in America or black people in Europe. They come with this false notion that everybody was black. You know them people who say, oh, you had to have black blood, black blood to be a samurai, or the Chinese were black, all of the Indians were black. Okay, man, I'm just finna show you the reality. So just, just stick with me and we gon' we gonna show you the truth. First people up are the Berbers. The Berber are the native people of North Africa in ancient times. Their tribes spread throughout the areas that constitute the states of Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, and Egypt, as well as the states in the Central Sahara and north of the Niger River. Niger River. Although many were Arabized after the 17th century, Berber peoples are plentiful in the mountainous regions, especially of Morocco and Algeria. They are pastoralists, agriculturalists, and hunters. But like I say, man, it's about to get interesting. Now, somewhere in America, some country's dude is popping their top. Oh, there ain't no Berber. There ain't no Berber. Berbers are black. Berbers are black. Man, I'm, I'm finna show you the truth. But let me prove to you that these people have always been there. Especially in the time period that I'm talking about, the medieval time period. Ain't no getting around that, oh, these people have always been black. Nah, fam. These people have been here. Especially through modern history, what you call uh, written history, historical time period. These people have been there. We go to the writings of al Umari, the Arab historian. In the land of the Sudan, there are also three independent white Muslim kings who are Berbers. Let's rewind it one more time. In the land of the Sudan, there are also three independent white Muslim kings who are Berbers. The Sultan of Ur, the Sultan of an unknown name, the Sultan of Tatmika, the three are Muslim kings in the south of the west between Morocco and the country of Mali and his neighbors. Each of them is an independent sovereign. No one of them rules another, but the greatest is the king of Er. They are Berbers and dress more or less this like the Moroccans in the drawer and turban with chin band. Having no horses, they ride camels. camels. Neither the Marinid Sultan nor the ruler of Mali has any authority over them. They live as desert dwellers do. So as you see from the writings of Al-Yumari, those people have been there. 
So don't take issue with me. Take issue with him. So let us try this one more time. You got the Amazon people, Amazi, or the Rafian, the Shula, Swasa, the Kabal, often described as one of three major groups of blood burgers. The Shawaya, I'm not gonna try that name, and the Ahaga people. And he goes all the names. This is just the A. This is just the name starting with A. They got names that or groups of people or tribes of people who names start with A. This is all the way from A to Z. I just got the A because it was too much. But this them. They've always been there. Broadly speaking, the political and social organization of the Berbers is relatively democratic, with the exception of the Tureg, who support aristocratic, nomadic institutions. The essential future of their society being the existence of a great number of a small democratic communities, each entirely independent and governed solely by the will of the people. They provided support to the Arabs in their conquest of the Iberian Peninsula and subsequently developed several powerful kingdoms and empires, the most important of which were those of the Almoravids, the Omahids, the Marinids, and the Asades or the Sadiene dynasty. This is a picture actually of two regs jousting or play fighting they not important what I want you to take notice of is the brother in the background right in front of the rock just look up the two rags up front and the brother in the back all right now quick sidetrack I'm not about to read the whole thing I want you to read the parts that I have highlighted pause the video take your time but I'm not going to read it. I'm trying to be fair and unbiased. Straight down the line. So take your time with it. You know what, fam? This is my presentation. I can only do it my way. And this is me being honest with you. Them poverty pimps just been lying to you. So uh, let's, let's keep it going. During the period of Muslim domination of Spain and Portugal, Christians who already equated color with religious infidelity were well disposed to adopt the color prejudice of neighboring Muslims. The enslavement of black Africa's children was so well established among the Spanish Muslim community that in the 13th century, poet Ibn Sa'il welcomed the beginning of spring with the following verses. So hold up, let's, let's hit that highlight button. Spring has come with his whites and his blacks. Two classes, his lords and his slaves. Now you just let that sink in for a minute. Now here go my brothers, the Mendy, also known as Mali, Manding, Mandingo, or Mandigi, are a West African people. They comprise numerous groups, the most important of which are the Bambara, the Bensusi, Julia, or Malinke, Marco, Somo, and Soninke. Now, to be honest with you, these are modern names. For example, uh, Bambara in, in Arabic writings just meant somebody that wasn't a Muslim or non-Muslim black person. And Julia was somebody who was a traitor, or not traitor as if they traded against them, but they went to community to community trading products and goods. That's all, but these are mostly modern names. Another example would be Malinke, which basically meant somebody from the Mali Kingdom, not a look or not a certain group of people, but just meant somebody from the Mali Kingdom. All right, the many people are acknowledged among the earliest people to engage in the independent development of deep plowing techniques. They were the founders of the Soninke state of Ghana and subsequently the Mali Empire. The House of People, also called Ethnu. Afnu, Arna, Asna, I'm not going to try to go through all the names, form the largest ethnic group in West Africa. They do not only constitute the largest ethnic group in each of Niger and Nigeria, but also have minorities of varying sizes in other West African states. Because of extensive migration, they are found in enclaves in various African cities as far south as the Atlantic coast. 
The history of the houses can be traced back to some 3,000 years ago, at which time they settled between Sungai and Kanin Brunu in what was later called Houserland and succeeded in adapting and or developing deep plowing techniques and irrigation systems, as well as engaging themselves in animal husbandry, mining, ironworking, and trading. The reality is the houses are not a tribal group. They are a community of people of various ethnic origins who speak a common language. Habi means non-Fulani and was used by the Fulani to describe the pre-Jihai rulers of Houserland. In this instance, he's talking about the Shihu, Usman Dunfodio, Alayhi wa sallam, may he be enshrined in Allah's barricade. When he was describing the Habi kingdoms, or Habi kings who was trying to kill him. But this is just the reality of it. The Fulani, also known as Boro, Bororan, Falata, Falata, Fala, Fala, Fula, Falata, Fubi, Fula, Hule, Hulani, Paul, Tarub, form the largest pastoral nomadic group in the world and are one of the largest Muslim groups in Africa. These people are found in 20 different West and East African countries, especially in Benin, Burkina Faso, Cameroon, Central African Republic, Chad, Ethiopia, the Gambia, Guinea, Guinea Basu, Kenya, Mali, Mauritania, Niger, Nigeria, Senegal, Sudan, and Togo. A lot of y'all got their blood in y'all, but y'all deny it, because y'all Egyptian though, right? Originally, the Fulani were a pastoral nomadic people and subsequently got involved in religious wars, which resulted in their developing an empire and establishing themselves as a ruling kingdom in, in, in many parts of West Africa. Originally, also, they were part of the Sultanate of Sokoto during the reign of the Hausa Fulani Empire under the Shihu Usman Donfodio. The Tureg, also Targwe, or the Tureg and Tureg, are an Arab Berber speaking pastoralist people of West Africa. They live in a number of North and West African states. They speak the Tamahawk or Tamashik in dialects of the Arabic language. The Tureg are a Muslim people comprised of shifting confederations and alliances. In their turn, these are made up of many tribal and sub tribe groups. And I know a lot of y'all. Popping y'all tops. Like, what the hell, bruh? The two regs were black. Most definitely the two regs were black. Regardless of what I show y'all, y'all still will believe that. But I got you, fam. I got you. Yeah, some of them are black. I got you. We go to the writings of Rachman and al -Sadi. They are all wanderers in the Sahara. Nomads with no settled dwelling. Nor do they have any town to which they resort. The area of the Sahara they roam over covers a distance of two months' travel between the lands of the Sudan and the lands of Islam. They profess the religion of Islam and are Sunnis, waging jihad against the blacks. It's Rachman al Sayyid, the Tariq of Sudan. Not my words. I'm trying to be even, trying to be fair. But I got you, fam. This is what a lot of you Americans looking for. I told you I got you, but it's complicated. It's complicated. So we're going to go straight to the two regs and let them tell it themselves or themselves. The two regs are less a race than a community of people belonging to the same culture conveyed by the same language. The subject of slavery has been used and continue to be used to stir up the hatred of the people of the South against us. The people of the South are the black people. The severe policies adopted by the Niger and Mali administrations toward the Tureg represent only a series of revenge. See, his book was written in the 90s during a political upheaval in Mali because after the French colonization, they turned over power to Mali and uh, Niger to the blacks. And the blacks kind of took their revenge out on the Tureg. It's a whole lot of stuff been going on in the 90s, the early 2000s, and even later as 2014, 2015. But y'all wouldn't know about any of that because y'all American. Y'all just care about romanticizing history. All right, now we start again. They are angry with us. Speak to us again and again about the past, where they were the servants and we the masters. 
but no one reproaches the Europeans for having thrown blacks, sold by blacks themselves, like cattle in the holes of boats, bound for the Americas. History, this devil. Ah, oh, shit got real. The only thing that can be criticized of the Tuareg is that of being militarily stronger than the others. In time of war, the conqueror takes his booty. The Tuaregs frequently brought prisoners to the encampment with them. But later, these slaves became integrated into the families of all. They were treated in practically the same way as the others. Their children grew up with the children of the masters. And when they had acquired a small capital, a herd, they often left on their side as free men. Of course, we can be reproached for having imposed on the serfs the hardest work, the chores which consisted of keeping the flock or fetching water from the well. We also levied a tax on the caravans of the slave traders who passed through our land. But the Tuareg never practiced the slave trade. Now, you could, you could decide if he's telling the truth or not. That's up to you. This remains the prerogative of Arabs and Europeans. The I clan, as we called them, they were more servants than slaves. Their descendants are the two rag of black skin that we find amongst us today. That is why, to designate ourselves, we prefer the name of Kael Tamashik, those who speak the Tamashik language, two rag of noble, clear skin. Shit got real, man, like I told y'all. They were more servants than slaves. They were more servants than slaves. Their descendants are the two rag of black skin that we find amongst us today. Man, I think we need a break or something, man. Stuff just got real, man. Other names, Harriton, Bozo, Bella. Don't take my word for it, though, man. Now, I want y'all to meet my little homie, Rabadoo. Rabadoo is a slave. There's Rabadoo wrestling the camel. And if you don't believe me, Rabadoo is a slave. Read what it says. Now, they say he may leave if he wishes. I want you to tell me where the hell is he going. And there goes the owners of Rabadoo. It's sickening. See, now a lot of y'all might be thinking, oh, he's just trying to paint blacks in a bad light. But the reality is, I'm just trying to show you the truth. I'm going to show you the opposite side of this. I'm going to show you the blacks dominating the Berbers because that actually happened a lot. So don't get it twisted that I'm just trying to show the bad stuff. I'm going to show the glorious blacks too. Now let us move on before people think I'm being biased and not being fair and honest. It's the Shua or the Bagara Arabs. These are a West and Central African Arab people and of Nigeria's ethnic minorities. The Shua are concentrated in the Lake Chad region of Northeastern Nigeria and Eastern Niger. A large group of them are presently in the state of Bornu, formerly Bornu. The Shua's neighbors include the Budama Konori. I want you to remember their name, Konori. They are essentially a tribal people engaged in herding and livestock. This book kind of old, but it, it gives a, a good explanation of the people. And just because they got the name Arab doesn't mean they come from Arabia. Because you know they'll be saying, Oh, the Arabs are black. The Arabs are black. It's only you and two authors on the planet believe it. And all of y'all American. So what does this say? But moving on, those who spoke a dialect of Arabic known as Hassaniya, they are often called Moors. Those who spoke the Berber languages are considered Tuareg. Although they share many of the same territories, both consider themselves as distinct and superior to the neighboring, neighboring desert edge black populations. Now we're talking about the word more, or the people who y'all want to call Moors. 
more a shifting and slippery label in medieval Iberia. Prior to the campaigns of maritime expansion initiated by Portuguese travelers in the 15th century, the Moor, or Portuguese Moro, Castilian Moro, was the emblematic African and Iberian literary and historical imagination. Moor is alternatively denotative and connotative, precise and imprecise, historically accurately, or historically accurate, and basically made up. Etymologically speaking, geographic writings gave birth to Moro as a generic label. Basically, it's not precise, man. It's a made up word, man. A label given to people from outside. It's like I've been told y'all. It's European usage only. Good luck finding that word amongst the people talking within each other. Good luck finding it. Because you won't. It's just non existent. The term more signified their Muslim enemies wherever they encountered them in the world. Speaking about Europeans. Now, you're about to hear me say certain things, but it's just out of respect. Nothing more, nothing less, man. So, you hear me say the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I'm just showing respect. So, don't get it twisted, man. It's just an objective view. Nothing more, nothing less. All right, so we're going to talk about some of the notable Muslims caught up in the transatlantic slave trade. Even though we're not talking about Europeans or the transatlantic slave trade, I got to give you some of the few notable people. We got Benjamin Solomon. He was sold to the same captain, he who himself was trying to sell slaves to only days earlier. We got Abdul Rockman of Natchez, Mississippi. His father was the partner to Karmaco Alpha of the uh, MMA of Fototulan. If you want to know how peaceful Islam spread, just ask the Jalanke people. They, they, they got Islam through straight up jihad. It wasn't peaceful at all. In fact, when they caught the non-Muslims, when they caught after a rock man, they said they sold him for fun, basically to get back at his father. But moving on, we got Bilali Muhammad and Sally Bilali, or Bilali. A famous quote from Muhammad Bilali is, I will answer for every Negro of the true faith, but not for the Christian dogs you own. This is from the Georgia Sea Islands, and they had an influence over the, the Gullah people from Georgia. Got Lamane Kebby mentioned both male and female teachers in his homeland, including an influential aunt who is unnamed. He's also famous, or is it somebody else that's famous for saying, or famous for saying white people are ugly? He got Abu Bakr Sadiq. He wrote one of the only autobiographies in Jamaica under the name of Edward Dunlan. We got Umar Abin Said. Umar is actually an a interesting character. He's the legendary Moor of the Carolinas. Many myths surround him such as he was a convert to Christianity as an Arabian who found no fault with American slavery and he despised Africans. That's, a, that's just one of the myths around him. Another myth is, or myths, it was any of the people talking about Carolina Moors, they usually got a, a twisted up story of Umar Abin Said. His autobiography is actually pretty good. Too small, but it's pretty good and interesting. Now we got Muhammad Ali bin Said, or Nicholas Said, a Kanori, just that name from earlier, born just west of Lake Chad, present-day Nigeria, into a prosperous military merchant family around 1833 in the kingdom of Bernou. He was kidnapped by Berbers and marched across the Sahara, sold in Tripoli, taken by a rich man in Mecca, served for various masters throughout Europe, traveled across five continents, including Russia, spoke seven languages fluently, including French and Italian. He gained his freedom because he worked for a lot of rich people, statesmen. He came to America as a free man. He joined the Union Army and fought in the Civil War. When asked why did he join the Army, he said because all his folks seemed to be doing so. He was a member of the 55th Regiment of Massachusetts, colored volunteers, not the 54th from the movie Glory. 
Also, he uh, he actually took a demotion in the military to learn medicine. He figured that he would try to learn something from the Europeans to take it back home to his country to teach his people. But the last we heard of him was he when he was a teacher in Detroit. And then he got a letter from Tennessee or something while he was in Tennessee. And he died in Tennessee, somewhere above Memphis. He was also, uh, before he was kidnapped, he was also a fighter against the Shihu, Usman Danfodio. He called the Shihu a, a false prophet. Now, why did people convert to Islam? But before we go into farther, a lot of y'all ancestors was, was Muslims. Some say 10%, some say 20%, some say 30% of the enslaved Africans that were shipped to the Americas were Muslims. But we'll never know because we'll never know the exact number because they weren't practicing Muslims in the sense that you see today, like the, the Turad or the Murad or the Kadaya or the Tanzania. They weren't Muslims in that sense that you see today. They were nominal Muslims, but we're going to talk about that in a minute. But was it peaceful or violent? That's a, that's a, a tricky question. That's a tricky one. The term conversion does not adequately define what occurred. These difficulties are voiced by Ray when he makes the point that it would be misleading to speak of the process of Islamization as a process of conversion from African belief to orthodox Islamic religion. A gradual blending took place between African and Islamic elements, making a new configuration which assumed different forms in different areas so stuff is difficult man it, it wasn't a you not muslim today and you muslim tomorrow type thing and now nah, it didn't work like that now you can paint the picture that islam spread peacefully but you got to answer the questions of what time period you're talking about and also which locations are you talking about the same goes for the other way if you say Islam spread violently. Which time period are you talking about and which exact locations are you talking about? And also which people are you referring to? Because like I say, West Africa is 2 million square miles. You got a lot of stuff, a lot of different people <laughs> and a lot of different time periods. So which time period are you talking about? You can pack the picture either way, but you got to answer those questions. Nominal Muslims. The three major empires of Ghana, Mali, Sangha were all nominal Muslims. And I'm going to show you what a nominal Muslim is in the, in the next video. A person dancing around mixing their Islam together is a nominal Muslim. Because like I said, the stuff you see today is relatively speaking modern. It wasn't the Islam that you would see in these in those empires back in those days. About 50 miles from the capital, Bamako, I meet the hunters. They brandish their 19th century flintlock rifles and their talismans. The Islamists who now control northern Mali hate all this. But the hunters' culture goes back a thousand years and they like to show it off. These men see themselves as Muslims, but they mix their Islam with animism, traditional culture. And they know that if the Islamists came down from the north to here, then they'd be the first target. But they're an essential part of Malian culture. They show me how they aim their rifles. No shooting, though, because it's Ramadan. And they say they can always send magic to destroy the Islamists. We are scared of the new Islamic wave. When they see us wearing hunters' clothes, they won't regard us as Muslims. They'll automatically think we are infidels who cannot know Allah. But our external appearance is different from what we feel inside. These foreigners are showing us a kind of Islam which has never been Prophet Muhammad's message by taking knives and killing others. Allahu Akbar! Allah. 
the people of Timbuktu have already seen what the Islamists can do. Last month, Al-Qaeda's local allies set upon the city's famous Sufi landmarks. The guardian of the mausoleum of al Moya could do nothing but watch. The jihadis say the shrines are idolatrous. Crowds came out in protest, but to no avail. The Islamists have since destroyed more shrines. Now, in a video, this is what you would call disbelief. The mixing of, of Islam, this is what you call disbelief. And it's always been a problem in West Africa, especially before the Sufi movement. When we go to the writings of the Shihu, he, the Shihu, found among the people of these lands all types of shocking disbelief, corruption, disobedience, and repulsive conditions which had spread and permeated the lands of central Belize or Sudan, to the point where there was hardly anyone who could be found whose iman was sound and whose worship was correct. The majority of his people were ignorant of Taweed and illiterate of how to properly perform the ablution. Prayer, alms, fasting, or the remainder of the acts of worship. Among them were those who were pure, pure disbelievers who worshiped stones in the gin and who openly committed acts of disbelief. They did not pray, fast, nor give alms. They denounced Allah and said things about Allah which were not deserving of his exalted rank. These included the majority of the common people of the black lands. This from Sultan Muhammad Bello. Now, it wasn't so much as to the extreme of the people of Americas. You know, the people who say Allah came as a man, you know, them type of people. It wasn't that extreme. Characteristics of a nominal Muslim. Little more than an adoption of Islamic names in addition to indigenous titles. Participating in certain Islamic rites, such as the annual sacrifices. Some attendance to a Friday mosque. This much identification with Islam was regarded as prestigious by the king's still pagan subjects. Now you should have noticed the absence of following Islamic law. And this was a huge problem in West Africa. The following of Islamic law. But they certainly were not willing to see their native beliefs and customs wholly abandoned. The kings were also unable to fully accept Islam, even if they wanted to. Now, we get, when we get to Mansa Musa, I'm going to show you how they made complaints on Mansa Musa about not following Islamic law. Also, when we get to Askiya Muhammad, I'm going to show you how he complained to Kareem Magali about Sunni Ali or Shia Ali going back to the forest to practice magic. And that was completely non-Islamic. And also, even if they wanted to be complete, straight-up Muslims, the people weren't going. They just weren't going to let no Muslims come in from out of town and just take over their country. It didn't work like that. Songhai and Mali had been Islamic empires to the extent that Islam had become integrated into the imperial texture, both ideologically and institutionally. Yet even the great masters and askias who had been exposed to strong Islamic influence through the trans-Saharian context with the wider Muslim world remained attached to the pre-Islamic heritage as the source for the legitimacy of their kingship, like I just stated. Almost all their subjects, peasants, herdsmen, and fishermen were animists, and Islam was confined to the towns among the traders and the ulama. Now let's talk about these Arabic sources. Most of these Arabic sources are prejudiced and racist towards Sub-Saharan Africans. This is due mostly to cultural and religious practice differences. These views are not limited to Sub-Saharan Africans. Why? Because they also talk bad about white people, which you will see briefly. Now I'm going to try and put you in their mind frame. Just follow along. And trust me, it's going to make sense. Just follow along. The Nile of the Blacks. 
as the composite West African river came to be known, first make its appearance in the literature of the Book of Highways and Kingdoms by the scholar al Bakri. Writing in 1067, he made use of the work of the al Warwick, a geographer of the previous century, but evidently drew extensively on oral accounts of merchants who had visited West Africa. He refers to the Nile in several places, first as the river on which Tukwar and a number of other small states stood. Now you gotta be careful with this word Tukwar. This is clearly the river Senegal, which al Bakr indicates, but does not directly state, flows into the encompassing ocean, i.e. the Atlantic. Later, when describing the route from ancient Ghana eastwards, he remarks that at a certain point the traveler meets the Nile coming out of the land of the blacks. One travels along it to Turek, when it turns south into once again the land of the blacks. Here he is clearly referring to the great bend of the river Niger, which flows through the inland delta, along the Saharan fringes, and then turns south near modern Barum to continue on to its delta in modern Nigeria. Just stick with me, this is going to make sense. There on the banks of both the Senegal and the Niger, they met with West African merchants who exchanged good for gold, slaves, and other items. They did not, as we can tell, venture across this now. The other banks, which were said to be inhabited by naked pagans, often reputed to be cannibals, known under the cant names Lam Lam, Dam Dam, or Nam Nam, who seem to turn up wherever there is any now. On the one hand, they had no need to, unless they sought to discover the sources of the gold. On the other hand, crossing the river would have taken them beyond the lands of Islam and beyond the point where they could mount their camels and simply head back home. It was a dangerous country for both body and soul. Now, contrary to popular belief, y'all might think I try to paint the black people as some kind of weak people. Oh, that's far from the truth. I'm going to show you the bold side of the black people. I'm going to show you the conquerors. There was nothing weak about these black people. I know y'all like to claim this whole Moorish history, this Egyptian stuff, all that. But I'm here to tell you, them not my people. My people are in West Africa. And they were some bold, bad individuals. Names that Arabs came across during the conquest or through trade, though it is quite an odd list, Nuba, is a term familiar to us primarily in reference to peoples living immediately to the south of Egypt, but particularly to the inhabitants of the Christian kingdom based on Dungala. The Zagawa or Zagawa are mentioned by other writers as nomads who roamed an area north of Lake Tad and had a hand in founding the Kenan state of Goron, named for the Tibu. Zans is a generic term for Africans who were imported into the Central Islamic world from the East African coast of what are now Kenya and Tanzania, and who formed the core of a huge anti-caliphate revolt in southern Iraq in the late 9th century. Although Arab writers treat the term Zans as if it is talking about a certain group, it is clear that nothing unites the Zans other than stereotyped characteristics. A similar remark applies to the term Habesh, or Abyssinians, which included peoples of diverse languages and cultures, though probably with some predominance of Oromo. Barbar is wandering nomenclature which turns up in North Africa and in both East and West Africa and is no doubt derived from the Greek Barbary. Now we are about to get into some of their viewpoints. I'm going to start with the Christian doctor from Baghdad, Yawanis, generally known as Ibn Butlin, discussed the physical attributes and moral qualities of the Zans, the Habesh, the Zagwa, and the Nuba, the four gates which slaves entered into the Mediterranean world. He discusses these races, more precise, the women of these races, the Easterners, Turks, Indians. He praises most highly and contrast them with the Westerner. 
The northerners and southerners are also compared. The northern men are characterized as broad-chested and brave, and their women as sterile, because they do not cleanse themselves after menstruation. The southerners have cold stomachs and bad digestion. By character, they are docile and their lives are short. He has little good to say of the Zanj women. The blacker they are, the uglier they are. The more pointed or foul their teeth are, the less use they are, and the more it is to be feared they will harm you. They are generally of bad character and much given to running away. They are far the stereotype as being of merry disposition and born dancers and rhythmists. Sounds very familiar to the stereotype and popular representations of African Americans. Not my words. Their dispositions know no gloom. Dancing and rhythm are inborn in them and natural to them. Because of their inability to speak Arabic correctly, people turn to them for music and dancing. <laughs> it is said that if a Zanj fell down from heaven to earth, he would surely do so to a beat. Their women have the most sparkling front teeth because of the abundance of their saliva produced by their bad digestions. They endure drudgery. No sexual pleasure is to be had from them because of their smelly armpits and coarse bodies. Now you know he lying. You know he like black women. The Zagua women of bad character, foul mouth, they are worse than the Zanj or any other type of blacks. Their women are no good for sexual pleasure and their men no use for service. They are the worst of the blacks, just as the Armenians are the worst of the whites. Nubian and Abyssinian women, on the other hand, received high praise. Nubian women have dry bodies and soft skin. Their physical features are agreeable. They are religious, benevolent, modest, and chaste. They are submissive to their masters, as if they were created for slavery. Abyssinian women generally have soft bodies, pliant and delicate. They are prone to consumption and monetary fevers, and are not suitable for singing and dancing. They are submissive and docile, and may be trusted to look after people. He going in, huh? Now you got some writers who attempted to justify certain stereotypes, with what they call scientific support based on either the zodiac or planetary influences. An example of this school of thought, we may take the 10th century geographer Alhamdan. The world may be divided into four sectors. Each comprises three zodiacal signs influenced by one of the four elements, fire, earth, air, and water. In this scheme, Sub-Saharan Africa lies in the fourth or southwestern quadrant which comprises Cancer, Scorpio, and Pisces, and is under the influence of the element water. Ghana, and what he called the land of the naked blacks, are modeled on the triad of Cancer and are under the influence of Venus and Mars. Because of the joint influence of these two planets, it happens that many of the peoples of these two lands are ruled by a king and a queen, who are brother and sister. The man ruling the men and the queen ruling the women. Their temperament is very ardent. Their men like ornamentation and endeavor to make themselves attractive, dressing themselves like women. This is because influence of Venus. Nevertheless, they are virile and manly. They plunge into perilous situation and expose themselves to danger. And this is because of the influence of Mars. They are men of malevolence, malice, lying, duplicity and violence. On the other hand, the Nuba and the Zant and their neighbors to the south of India are all under the influence of Scorpio and Mars. For this reason, their character is more akin to that of wild beasts. They are given to quarreling enmity, disputes and hatred. They hold life cheap and are without pity for one another. Europeans live in the northwest sector, comprising Aries, Leo, and Sagittarius, and are dominated by Jupiter and Mars. Hence, they are generally unsubmissive people, loving liberty, and are hostile to proponents of law and order. Because some of the zodiac principles are masculine and some feminine, 
The men of this region show little jealousy about their women folk. But hold up, let's hit that highlight button. So let's go back a little bit. The men of this region show little jealousy about their women folk, but are more desirous of males and show more jealousy over them. Let that sink in a little bit. Some more northern Europeans people of Brittany, Galatia, Germany, and Dacia come under Aries and are influenced by Mars, which renders their people savage and reckless. On the whole, their character is close to that of wild animals. That is, they are irresponsible and have no religious system. So what I'm trying to get you to see is they're not just talking about black people. They're also talking about white people. Moving on, we go to the writings of Ibn Khaldun. We have seen that Negroes are in general characterized by levity, excitability, and great emotionalism. They are found to dance wherever they hear a melody. They are everywhere described as stupid. Now I'm just saying, this was written in a time period where black people were supposedly the kings and queens of Europe. You know, black people had civilized Europe. But hey, these are not my words though. Probably the best known of the early black poets in Arabic was Abu Dilema, a slave who became the court poet and jester of the first Abbasid Caliphs. The name means literally father of blackness. In his verses, the acceptance of inferiority is unmistakable. To amuse his master, Abu Dilema makes fun of his own appearance, of his aged mother, and of his family. We are alike in color. Our faces are black and ugly. Our names are shameful. Another story tells of a misadventure of the famous singer Syed Ibn Mischa, considered the greatest musician of his time. Seeking a lodging in Damascus, he managed to get himself accepted by one group of young men, the others being reluctant. He accompanied them to a singing girl's house, and when lunch was served, he withdrew, saying, I am a black man. Some of you may find me offensive. I shall therefore sit and eat apart. They were embarrassed, but arranged for him to take his food and later his wine separately. The enslaved girl singers appeared, and see it I, I being mischief praised their performance. Singers and owners alike were affronted by the impudence of this black man and daring to praise the girls, and he was warned by the other companions to mend his manners. You know, be a good boy now. Just shut up and be quiet. Later, his identity was revealed, and then all vied in seeking the company of the famous singer. These episodes show both the nature and the limits of social discrimination against the dark skin. Now we go on to the Arthur Al Jahiz of Bissera, the boast of blacks over whites. They say we are more striking to the heart and full to the eye, like the black girl is more striking to the eye and full in the breast than a white girl, and the night is more striking than the day. They say black is always more striking. Indeed, when the Arabs describe their camels, they say red, brown, and fast, but red is plentiful and black is beautiful. The Arabs take pride in blackness of color. Now, I would be doing you a disservice if I didn't give you a more complete view of Al Jahiz. He was a satirical author, a comedic style author. You don't know when to take him serious or when he's just trying to be funny. Like if you ever read his work, the, the, the Book of Animals, that's the book or, or the collection of work that he has, that people try to give him the credit of, of starting the, the theory of evolution. It's a lot of freaky stuff in there, that, that collection, by the way. But you don't know when he's trying to be serious or when he's just being comedic. And also, the boast of blacks over white is not the only book of his time period. They had a lot of satirical books from the time period. One in particular is called The Boast of Dogs Over Humans. Now, are we to take that serious, or are we to take Al Jahiz serious? But moving on, I'm going to show you some of the negative things Al Jahiz said. Now, in this same book, Al Jahiz counted the Chinese as black people. I'm just saying. 
Here go the other stuff they won't tell you about Al Jahiz. We know that the Zans are the least intelligent and the least discerning of mankind and the least capable of understanding the consequences of actions. Like the cow among mankind are the Zans, for they are the worst of men and the most vicious of creatures in character and temperament. They maintain that eloquence is prized by all people at all times. Even the Zans, despite their dimness, their boundless stupidity, their obtuseness, their crude perceptions, and their evil dispositions, make long speeches. I ain't gonna say nothing else, man. I'm not trying to be biased. I'm just trying to give you fair and straight down the line, man. Imam Josie, an uh, author that I particularly enjoy. People should actually focus on his works more than the, the satirical author Al Jahiz. His book, The Virtues of the Blacks and the Habish. Now to our topic, I saw a group of eminent Habish who were disheartened because of their dark color. I explained to them that respect is a granted in accordance with good deeds rather than with good appearance. And I wrote this book to recall the virtues of a great many of the Habish and the Blacks. I have divided it into 28 chapters. Now this is actually a good book, man. You should check it out. Here go the chapters of the book. Now I'm not for to read all of them. You can check them out yourself. But uh, what you got to understand is books like this and Al Jahiz of Bissera. And there are actually two other books that are trying to take up for black people. But what you got to understand is... Those books are written in places where black people are overwhelmingly outnumbered and blacks are usually treated in a bad way in those areas. Books like this just don't exist in black lands. It's the same that that's how these books exist in America, how blacks did this, blacks did that. It's because we are outnumbered here in America. It's the same psychological thing going on. Now we're at a point where we're actually about to start learning about the history of West Africa. Everything up until now has just been the, the background, the backdrop, just to get your mind ready for what's about to go down. Now you have to consider the author's perspective, the time period that they are living in, because you had a time period where you're talking about a hundred or so years after the Moroccan invasion, the Berbers have some power. The blacks are still vying for power. You have political upheaval. It's a whole bunch of stuff going on. So they're going to say some things that we, might, we may not find agreeable. But just don't worry about it. Just follow along. And this is about the origins of Mamu Kadi, one of the presumed authors of the Tariq Fatouche. I say presumed because we know for a fact that there are forgeries of the Tariq Fatouche. More than likely by Amadou Lobo. Amadou Lobo is from the Mycena Caliphate. They were all black people, but they were racist toward other black people. They put in a Tariq Fatouche that certain black people are just made to be slaves. And as you can see, he goes on to state that the progenitor of the Katy family may have come from Spain and married a local Sanike woman. But you read it for yourself. Now, I just told you the time period they were living in, who was in power, and the political upheaval. I told you that because you have to see it from their perspective, through their eyes, from their mind frame or their mindset. Because they're going to say some things that are just not agreeable to us. Now, check this out. On the origin of the Ghana dynasty, there is no consensus about the tribe of these princes. Did they belong to the Wakwari, like those who came before them, or to the Wangara, as some say? What is known is not reliable or precise. According to the most reliable sources, they came from the Sahanja, for they are referred to in their genealogies by the term Akasuba, which is the same as the surname Ham in Sudanese arts. What is more certain is that they were not blacks. God alone knows the truth, for these events happened a long time ago in lands that are very far from us. Thus it is impossible for historians of our time to speak with true certainty about them, 
or to narrate them in a manner without further speculation, for they have no ancient chronicles to rely upon. Now, is it true what he wrote? Yes, he wrote it, but is it historically accurate? No, not at all, because even he himself goes on to contradict himself later on in his very book. Now, on the origins of Achman al Sadi, the author of the Tariq Sadan, we get it from the author himself. Despite his bad treatment of the scholars, Shi Ali or Sunni Ali acknowledged their worth and show kindness and respect to some of them. Now these, Rockman now said his own words. He would say, were it not for the scholars, life would not be pleasant or agreeable when he raided the Fulani tribe of San Fratero. He sent many of their women as gifts to the elders of Timbuktu and to some of the scholars and holy men, telling them to take them as concubines. Those were not scrupulous about the practice of their religion did so, while the punctilious married them. Among the latter was the grandfather of my grandmother, my father's mother, the virtuous, worthy, astic, Said Amin Abdullah, who married the woman sent to him, who was called Aisha, the Fulani. To her was born Nana Berture, the mother of my father's mother. My father met this woman when she was very old and blind. See, he's talking about his black blood. On the oranges of Mali, what he's talking about is Ghana. He has Ghana and Mali twisted up. Mali is a very large and extensive region in the far west, extending toward the Atlantic Ocean. The first ruler to establish a state there was Kayamaga, or the king of the gold. The seat of his sovereignty being Ghana, a large city in the land of Bagana. It is said that the state was founded before the prophet Muhammad's mission and that 22 kings ruled before that event, and 22 after, making a total of 44 in all. They were by then in origin, though we do not know from whom they were originally descended, meaning they were white in origin, and their vassals were Saninke. When their dynasty came to an end, they were succeeded by the Malians, who belonged to the Sudan or to the blacks. Now we're about to get into the actual history of Mansa Musa.